Hello and welcome to the third of our three gin-based videos with my good friend and gin expert Trish. Uh, so the reason that I did ask Trish on to talk about gin is that she managed one of Melbourne's most famous gin bars, or probably the most famous gin bar in Melbourne, uh, called Gin Palace for eight and a half years. Which is kind of like dog years and bartender years, that's about 50. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so definitely a really awesome fountain of knowledge on this spirit. And she's now taken that and has gone to work for Fever Tree because, as they say, if three quarters of your drink is a mixer, then it should probably be a good one. Um, the best. <laughs> so that's probably where we should start in this one. We're kind of looking at different ways to use gin and gin and tonics are obviously the thing that come to most people's minds straight away. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Fever Tree and what their kind of mission was when it came to, to actually making these mixes? So tonic was an anti-malaria medicine. We already discussed if you were a part of the army or the navy, you were given a daily ration of gin. So in the 19th century in India, troops who were stationed there had to have their daily ration of anti-malaria medicine, which is called a tonic. So because tonic was quite bitter, it actually comes from the bark of a tree called the cinchona tree. And quinine is the property as an anti-malaria medicine. They didn't really quite like the flavor so much. So what they were doing is they were putting their daily ration of gin into their tonic to make the tonic more palatable. And that's the birth of the gin and tonic. So tonic goes back a very long way. And I guess the best thing about Fever Tree is they wanted to harness that story and create natural flavors and go to these parts of the world where you can get these amazing flavors like you would with coffee or tea and reinvigorate these really amazing gins. You know, gin isn't one size fits all and neither is tonic anymore. So is the idea that you would kind of pair each of these with a certain type of, of gin? Indian tonic water is where it all began. It matches really well with your classic London dry style. It is a little bit more bitter, paying homage to being an anti-malaria medicine. Fever Tree uses these beautiful bitter oranges from Mexico and also marigold flower. So a little bit floral but quite bitter. And that pairs perfectly with the London Dry being very juniper dominant like we've talked about, being very fragrant and a little bit louder as a style. But it's definitely not for your more subtle gins. So you've also got your Mediterranean tonic water, invented for your more delicate Mediterranean floral style of gins. These lemon thyme and rosemary from Provence and it is quite delicate, half the amount of quinine, so you really can taste your gin through it. This was actually the tonic that got me onto tonic. It's uh, kind of a gateway tonic, I might say. Which is why I didn't realize this until recently, but Trish was not a gin drinker when she started working at Gin, at gin Palace, or a tonic drinker. <laughs> not at all, it's a slippery slope, look at me now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so this guy kind of obviously the obvious the obvious one to put it with is Gin Mari. Mediterranean botanicals, absolutely. And uh, a bit of a cheat sheet for you. Colours pair up. So if something is blue, goes with blue. If something pink, goes with pink. If you get a, a cheese. You from... guys think this bartending is <laughs> no, difficult. It's, it's really, really not. <laughs> like if you get a, a wine and a cheese from a certain part of France, for example, they're going to go together very well. And this fun, speaking of pink, this fun looking pink one, what, what's that one about? So we did talk about how you were given a ration of gin if you were in the army or the navy. Good times. So bitters. Everyone's heard of Angostura bitters before, I hope. Everyone's got Angostura bitters. It was invented to be an anti-nausea for sailors. So these sailors, these naval personnel, were given their ration of gin every day. They were also kind of seasick, so they put their bitters into their gin. And, you know, this is how cocktails were born. It was just like mixing it all together and having a great time. And so we took out the middleman and added pimento, Angostura bark, of course, Madagascan vanilla, ginger, and cardamom. So it's quite a fragrant style that works really well with spice-led gins. And then the, you know, it's kind of, the sun is, is starting to come out, which I feel leads to, well, in Australia anyway, sorry for the rest of the world that are just heading into winter. But this guy is kind of my go-to in summer, the elderflower on it. Fever Tree elderflower is really fragrant and I would almost think it's kind of like a cocktail on its own. It's these beautiful elderflowers, which are such a precarious flower to use because they only bloom for about six weeks of the year. Fever tree harvests them in the nighttime when they're at full bloom, very moist. 
to harness and lock in that beautiful elderflower flavour. So Hendrix is a very common floral style of gin and I say to everyone you really haven't had a Hendrix gin and tonic until you've had it with fever tree elderflower because it is so Which sounds like a brand line but is actually kind of true. Like. It really is though and um, you know I guess like on that point like being a bartender as you are it's I work for you know, Maya, I work for a gin company I admire. It's probably for us, and correct me if I'm wrong, but all you want to do at the end of the day is give someone a drink that they really enjoy. And it sounds really cheesy, but that's what I enjoy and love and gets me through the day. The kind of big fashion nowadays is for a heap of crazy garnishes in, in your gin and tonics. Do you, A, do you kind of uh, reckon that it actually makes a pretty big difference? Um, B, do you have some go-tos that you like to, to fall back on? I think the biggest thing is compare or contrast. So with anything, it's like a cheat sheet to be like, oh, that one's floral, that's floral. I'll put a floral garnish in there, perfect. Compare. Contrast is also very important when you might have uh, Mediterranean herbs and flavors. It's like quite savory, herbal. You might want something a bit floral, maybe a bit salty. So uh, for example, with the Fever Tree Mediterranean and Gin Marais, both Mediterranean, herbaceous, a little bit of floral from the tonic. Maybe you want to add a bit of salt, like a little bit of olive. So compare or contrast, definitely. Yeah. It's very important. And I mean, I guess I talk about that this in all the videos, it is, it is that balance. Like it's, it's really not rocket science. It is just thinking about rounding out flavors. Um, as you say, otherwise, it will probably be a perfectly good gin and tonic. But I think the awesome thing about garnishes is it can just elevate it. So I definitely, I really like using herbs as we've discussed, because A, they look really pretty and B, the, um, you know, obviously your, your, you taste with your nose first. So kind of getting that gets your brain ready almost for what it's going to taste like. Also looking at some different kinds of citrus, like oranges and grapefruits, as much as lemons and limes are awesome. Um, that can just kind of highlight some other flavors that maybe you wouldn't find in the gin super easily without them kind of in there to just underpin them. Now on to my next favorite topic is martinis. Uh, so we do have um, some lengthier episodes on martinis in depth, but obviously, you know, speaking of the range of gins that we have here, um, it's pretty easy to see how you know, literally combining gin and vermouth, you could end up with however many permutations from that one drink. Do you have like a go-to style or, you know, if you're doing a wet martini, so with more vermouth or with a dry martini, what would you kind of pair with that? So martinis are very personal. Very, it's, it's someone's fingerprint, you know? So you can't get done for a crime without your fingerprint. So no one <laughs> should ever tell you you're in trouble for the martini you order. It's basically the same thing for me. So my... <laughs> Preference for a martini is a classic dry style, very gin forward, a little bit of vermouth and a twist of lemon. My favorite quote is by Dorothy Parker. It also makes me feel good about drinking quite a lot of martinis. <laughs> I like to have a martini, two at the very most. Three, I'm under the table or I'm under my host. <laughs> Tara's my host today, so watch out. Um, What's your favourite? <laughs> but you've made me enough, do you know? <laughs> I do know, you like them a little bit wet, you like them fierce, you like them salty and a little bit savoury. I do like a, I do like a yeah, savoury and wet martini. <laughs> um, so something like gin mari with plenty of vermouth in there. Um, which I guess kind of harks back to what we were saying about the balance, because if you have, if you are using those more kind of powerful and you know gins with a lot of flavour, um, actually just cutting it with that bit more vermouth, I find kind of makes it easier easier to drink rather than these quite simple straightforward gins. You can kind of just be straight down the line, like you know, pretty much just cold gin with it, and and um, it's not kind of too overwhelming flavour wise. Um, in terms of like something like Monkey 47, as we were saying, there's like heaps of botanicals in there, big juniper punch, high in alcohol. What would you do with that, do you reckon? Well, I classify that one as quite a loud floral gin because it's higher in alcohol to make it sippable. You might want to dial it back with smooth, so make it a wet martini. Again, compare or contrast. So to soften it, you might want to add a more delicate vermouth. 
to lighten it up a little bit, uh, balance it out for people who are not so intense. <laughs> but also like if someone likes a really massive flavor, you might want to match that with a really big, aromatic, forceful vermouth. Maybe even a bit of absinthe, but being floral, if you think about flowers, maybe you wouldn't have olives and flowers together, so you, you might not want to put olives in there or olive brine to make a dirty martini. You might want to garnish it with something bright and light and fresh to balance that out. So I love a grapefruit peel or maybe lime peel because they're louder citrus aspects. I think that would work really well. Yeah. And in terms of these, we kind of touched on like with the barrel aged and the old tom, they're kind of like um, a little bit sweeter maybe and sort of rounder. Um, do you have any sort of go-tos or any cocktails that you would reach for those over, over maybe a London Dry or a New World style? Gin. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges as a bartender, um, well now gin's cool so everyone drinks it, but back in my day people didn't drink gin because they're like, oh it's, you know, it's gross, that's really intense, whatever. So the ways that you'd kind of wean people onto it were with an old Tom style, that which a sweeter kind of style, that in a Tom Collins, so fresh lemon juice, a bit of sugar, topped off with soda and tall glass, kind of like an old style pub squash, lemonade, you know, it's a great flavour that you associate with your childhood a bit. With a barrel aged gin, maybe someone's a whiskey drinker and you might want to convert them because you work in a gin bar and <laughs> it's your job. you were one of those people. <laughs> so you can use it in place of whiskey or you might make an old fashioned, uh, you might want to mix it with a different kind of sugar. So you could think about things like honey, a different kind of bitters that might be a bit lighter and a nice fresh bit of orange. And that is a good way to not alienate people from things they already drink. So that's probably what I'd recommend. Um, and I guess kind of the same thing maybe with your more sort of slow and, and infused um, gins. What, what's your sort of go-to for, for that? If, is it again if maybe people are not super into gin or...? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is very far from a traditional gin, those gin infusions. They are very fruit driven. So you can utilize them in a lot of different ways. I guess like the one that won most people over for me with slow gin is a gin sour, which is a cocktail that any bartender can make or should. No, <laughs> so, you know, two measures of slow gin, one measure of lemon, half a measure of sugar, or maybe a bit less to taste because it is a sweetened style, egg white or Wonder Foam or one of these new world ways to emulsify and make it a fluffy drink, shaken, served up or over ice, and you've got this beautiful, fresh, fragrant plum flavor. Works really well as well. Well, that's making me thirsty, so we might leave it like that and go get a gin. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> um, so hopefully that's given you a little bit of insight into different ways that you can utilize um, all of this you know, amazing spirit that you have available to you. Um, and maybe the next time that you're making a gin and tonic, have a little think about what flavors you're looking for in the gin and that you want to enhance with the mixer and the garnish. Um, and treat yourself, make yourself a little fancy one for, for your next sunny day in the garden. So maybe let me know in the comments what your favorite gin and tonic combination is or what your favorite martini is. If you haven't watched the two other episodes that we have on gin, then please feel free to click on the link below. Thank you very much for watching and now you know.